बिस्मिल्ला रमान रहीम प्लीज सेटल डाउन वी गोन टू फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल वेलकम मिस बॉब ब्रेंडे हेयर एंड वी गोन टू हैव अ वेरी शॉर्ट फॉर्मेट बट क्राइम इन लॉट ऑफ इंटरेस्टिंग स्पीचेज इन बिटवीन एंड इन बिटवीन द सूप एंड एंड द लंच आप गुरु फर्स्ट रिक्वेस्ट द डॉटर ऑफ माई लेट फ्रेंड जवेद अखाई आई जवेद अखाई एंड माई सेल्फ वी स्टार्टेड दिस पाकिस्तान ब्रेकफास्ट आई स्टार्ट द पाकिस्तान ब्रेकफास्ट बट ही जॉइन मी अबाउट फाइव ईयर्स अगो एंड आफ्टर इज डेथ अबाउट सेवन मंथ्स अगो इज फैमिली केम टू मी एंड सेट दैट वी वुड लाइक टू कंटिन्यू बिकॉज दिस इज वॉट माई फादर वॉन्टेड एंड आई रियली डू मिस हिम ही वॉज अ विजनरी ही वॉज अ ग्रेट मैन एंड रियली ट्रू ब्लड पाकिस्तानी बिकॉज ही यूज टू कैरी द फ्लैग एवरीवेयर फॉर पाकिस्तान सो विदाउट फर्दर आई डो आई लाइक टू आस्क डॉक्टर अनम अखाई टू से फ्यू वर्ड्स थैंक यू सो मच इक्राम साहब मिस्टर ब्रेंडे प्रेजिडेंट वर्ल्ड इकनॉमिक फोरम मिस्टर क्राम सैगल चेयरमैन पाथ फाइंडर ग्रुप कराची काउंसिल ऑन फॉरन रिलेशन एंड डिस्टिंगश गेस्ट assalamu alaikum and a very good afternoon to all of you thank you all for gracing today's event with your valuable time and thank you so much for to our chief guest who uh, has taken out time from his valuable time and is here with us today over the years the world has come closer and closer through technology science diplomacy to create what can be positively positioned as a global village this global village strategizes world issues on platforms concerning social technological economics and political issues to find effective formulas for better living and i'm delighted to inform you that annual gathering of the world economic forum in davos is our prime example of a successful global village which patronizes all leading countries to participate and partake in global prosperity over the past 17 years mr ikram segal had single handedly shared the pakistan passion at wef davos by 2013 Martin Dow got recognized as a global growth company by WEF the first Pakistani pharmaceutical company to earn that achievement and our relationship with the world economic forum began today martin dow is ranked as one of the biggest pharmaceutical companies of pakistan and being the first to go global by acquiring two manufacturing facilities in france having witnessed the great work by mr segal my father and founding chairman martin dow group mohammad javed khai collaborated to create a bigger and more meaningful display of our country's assets the pathfinder group and martin dow group have been representing pakistan in davos for over 4 years with greater success we have jointly hosted the pakistan breakfast and lunch and introduced the pakistan pavilion where our country's talent strategic initiatives culture and philanthropy have been showcased with a single minded aim to improve the image of pakistan in the global playing field and i'm proud to say its success has fueled us to participate together in a bigger and broader way year after year it was the passion of mr ikram segal and mohammad javed khai that has made this partnership vital in taking pakistan's positive image to the world economic forum I would like to thank you all of all all of you once again for spending this afternoon with us and I'm sure that you will have uh, you will have a wonderful time during this discussion. Thank you. One of the people that Pakistan should be really proud of is Dr. Sania Nishta. And what he has done she has done for healthcare and now what she's doing for poverty alleviation is remarkable and uh, without further ado i request her to say a few words mr brande welcome to pakistan 
Mr. Brendayana Makai, Mr. Kram Segal, Governor State Bank, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and assalamu alaikum. Because this is an event to honor a guest from the World Economic Forum, I must put on my global hat for a moment. And I think on a sobering note, we have to be reminded that we are living in a world today which is plagued by a number of different challenges. We're looking at widening inequities, a number of demographic uh, and epidemiological challenges, uh, rampant urbanization. Uh, we today, at a global level, are perhaps confronted with the worst famine in, his in recent history, the largest wave in migration uh, since the Second World War. There are a number of different conflicts, uh, trade wars, economic tensions ongoing. The value of multilateralism is being questioned today. Uh, the principles of the United Nations framework is coming under question. Uh, and the world is, uh, we th the, the development gains of the last century uh, are in fact being threatened. You know, issues such as pandemics, uh, and antimicrobial resistance and the scourge of non-communicable diseases is threatening to wipe out the development gains of the last century. But in this very troubled context, there are some structured and systemic rays of hope. One of them is, of course, the sustainable development agenda, which focuses on systems building rather than vertical targets. The other one is the emphasis on human capital, which is bringing to bear the importance of of investments in human capital ranking predicated on the understanding that as soon as 2025, the borrowing costs of countries will be linked to their performance on, hum on human capital. The third ray of hope is the digital transformation, which has transformed the feasibility of the public sector and has the potential to do so for the, for the public sector as well. And then if there was a fourth beacon of hope, I would say it is the World Economic Forum. As an institutional entity, and I'm witness to that as one of the, few, as one of the veteran Pakistanis uh, on several fora, uh, I can clearly appreciate over the years what, has, what it has done for global cooperation and to bridge the disconnect, especially between the public and the private sectors, which was so, which was so crucial to be bridged. Now, many of you know the World Economic Forum as the star-studded event uh, and the convening in Davos. Uh, but it is the thought leadership that the World Economic Forum has provided over the years, which has been so transformational in, ag in global agenda setting over the years. And that part of the World Economic Forum is not very well known. Um, and it is not just the thought leadership, it is also the manner in which their advocacy has cascaded into new institutional arrangements, especially the institutional arrangements where the public and private sector capitalize on their comparative advantage, which is so innovative. Our revered guest comes from Norway and will bear me out that in the health sector, the World Economic Forum has helped to forge the Global Alliance for Vaccine Initiative, more recently CEPI, which dominate uh, some of the most delivery-oriented organizations which are helping, helping to save lives around the world, and there are many others from, uh, you know, in, in different thematic areas. So I want to thank you for all the work that you are doing uh, in terms of global cooperation. And I want to thank you for coming to Pakistan at a very opportune time. This is a time when a number of different far-reaching reforms have been initialized. We have every hope that these will be well institutionalized and will bear fruit very soon. A number of different transformative public sector agendas have been brought to the table, and the Prime Minister is personally leading a very well-coordinated effort to make sure that they come to fruition. Uh, we are thinking out of the box and very innovatively. For instance, as part of the new framework of the ESAS program, ESAS is the Urdu word for the meaning feeling, we are thinking about creating and are practically creating uh, a social welfare state, a 21st social welfare state, where social welfare means financial inclusion, where social welfare means leveraging of big data analytics to create precision safety nets, 
and where social welfare means providing the private sector with a level playing field and the new incentives to deliver on a public-private premise. So we really want to thank you for being at the table here in Pakistan. We want to thank you for the collaboration that I know will get up and running today. And I hope that some of us who have been very actively involved with the, with the World Economic Forum, and Ikram Saab has been the most longest standing um, a member of the World Economic Forum. Some of us in the room uh, have followed in his footstep and have very deep engagement in your various councils. And I hate to call myself the veteran of the global uh, agenda councils, uh, but, but, but I have been involved for the last uh, 12 years. We hope that we will be able to le leverage your knowledge networks and your capabilities and your, abil your convening ability to forge re meaningful relations between the public and private sectors at a time when the appetite to do new things in Pakistan and to do them structurally and well and with integrity and with transparency has never been at such a high. Thank you. A welcome again to Pakistan, and I hope you will enjoy our Pakistani hospitality. A few weeks ago, I was privileged to meet uh, Dr. Raza Bakir for the first time. And uh, he was at a panel in which uh, the advisor of finance, Dr. Fisheikh, and uh, Shabazadi, the chairman of FBR, was there. And uh, I looked, after what he spoke and what he said, I realized that it was like a breath of fresh air coming in. And I was absolutely amazed by the fact the way not only what he expressed his views about Pakistan going forward, but how he intended uh, to take control of the economy in his own sphere. So without further this thing, I request Dr. Zawakir to say a few words. Assalamu alaikum. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Mr. Ikram Chagal, thank you very much for the invitation to be here with all of your distinguished guests today. And Mr. Bren, let me welcome you to Pakistan. Let me also congratulate both Mr. Ikram Chagal and Mr. Bren for the timing of your visit, because you are coming to Pakistan at a time when things are getting better. We've had economic challenges, but one year later, I think you will be proudly able to look back on the timing of your visit and be able to say, inshallah, when the reforms will bear fruit, that you were one of the early ones who came to Pakistan and you saw the upswing. I would like to do two things in the time that I have. I would first like to share with you what is our own assessment of the economic challenges, the causes of the economic challenges that Pakistan has faced? And number two, I would like to talk to you about what are some of the most important stakeholders that we need to work with to address these challenges. Now, first on the causes of our economic challenges, it should not be a surprise to you, but it is good to summarize that there are two. One has been the external deficit that Pakistan has faced. By the external deficit, in simple terms, I mean the gap between our foreign exchange inflows and our foreign exchange outflows. This gap, the current account deficit that economists call, had risen to a historical high, averaging $2 billion per month. We have never in our history had such a high current account deficit. This current account deficit, a few years before, used to be zero. So something happened that it went from zero to a deficit of $2 billion. And there were many causes. One of those causes was an exchange rate that was not reflecting economic forces, not reflecting the balance between supply and demand. And while the bilateral value of the currency was being kept fixed, 
what economists call the real exchange rate was actually working against our exporters and working in favor of our importers. It was a tax on our exporters and a subsidy to our importers. No wonder the current account went where it did. At the same time, it took a toll on the foreign exchange reserves of the country and was the number one factor which put us in the predicament that we had. The second key cause of the economic challenges was the fiscal deficit. Our public debts and our deficits have grown significantly and have put our public debt back up in the range of around 70% of GDP or so. It used to be at these levels, but it came down, and again, it has risen up to those levels. Now, these are the causes of the challenges that confront us, but the important point is to look at what is being done on those causes. And the point that I want to leave you with is that those causes are being addressed in a very definitive manner, and I want to make it concrete what I mean by that. First thing I told you about was the current account deficit, and it was running at $2 billion per month. Well, that has now halved. That has come down to just $1 billion per month. It is still a deficit. It is still a significant amount. But if you look at the trend and if you look at the momentum, that is in the right direction. There are many things that have helped to make that possible. But one of the factors has also been an exchange rate that has begun to reflect the forces of demand and supply and is removing the bias that was against the exporters. So first, on the current account deficit, the first culprit of our problems, that is, the momentum is on our side. Second is the fiscal problem. We have a deficit that's been growing, and this budget that has been brought in is a budget of austerity that very credibly seeks to reverse that trend. The Prime Minister himself has gone on numerous occasions to express his firm and keen desire to ensure that we undertake the measures that are necessary to bring the deficit down and to convey to people that it is a time of austerity. As a country, we must all come together and play our role in bringing down this problem of our, of our economy. So in this first part, I just wanted to share with you that these were the two main causes of our problems, and both are being addressed, and therefore, therefore, we should be optimistic about the future, and therefore, I think the timing of your trip is very opportune because momentum is on our side. Now, who are the stakeholders that are needed if we want to make things better? And I would say there are many, but let me point out three. First is our exporters. We are facing a gap in our foreign exchange net position. Who can help to bridge that gap is our exporters. We need to support them, and we need their cooperation, and we need our country and our private sector to be competitive globally. In my experience, having worked in different institutions, working on issues of international economy, I would be hard-pressed to think of an emerging market that has sustainably raised its living standards without having a very competitive, viable export sector that competes in global markets. So first is our exporters. The exchange rate has helped them, but the exchange rate is not the ultimate solution. Ultimately, it has to come from improvements in competitiveness, an area that Mr. Bren would know very well from the work that the World Economic Forum does. I think the second key stakeholder to make this successful is our taxpayers, but I should qualify. 
not just the taxpayers, but more so the potential taxpayers, those who are not in the tax net right now. That is a key constituency whose cooperation is needed to firmly address our economic problems. I think the government is very conscious that the strategy is going to be more successful if instead of squeezing those who may already be in the tax net, that one goes after those who are not paying their fair share. And you would be well aware of all the good work being done by FBR, being championed by the Prime Minister himself to make this a more equitable and fair system where those who are evading taxes are brought into the tax net and contribute their share towards our shared prosperity. I think the third key stakeholder after exporters and potential taxpayers is the international community. In this regard, the government has recently unblocked what, was you, what used to be considered a major source of uncertainty a few months ago, which was the partnership with the IMF. The staff level agreement was reached. Then they had the meeting of the board, and the program was approved. That's a helpful step. It helps us that an, that an institution like the IMF enhances the credibility of our own reform program. Not only is it good from a credibility enhancement perspective, it also unlocks financing at cheaper rates from other sources, both official and the private sector. So that's a good thing that not only do they support what we want to do, but also that they are going to make it easier for us to borrow at a cheaper cost than before. Our goal, therefore, is to continue to build on the partnership with the international community. And I should mention that it has several aspects to it. One of them is also that we are determined to continue to make progress on issues also raised by the FATF. And it's, again, something that is also in the interest of Pakistan. And at the highest level, there is firm commitment to make decisive progress on any issues that have been identified as well. So let me then conclude with our outlook and, and, and why our outlook is very positive. And that is because the causes of our problems are being decidedly addressed. We have the momentum in the right direction. We have a partnership with the international community. And we have a decisive effort to make an equitable and fair tax system where those who are not doing their fair share are brought into it. What is the risk? I think the biggest risk is domestic. And that is what I find cynicism. I think we have all the grounds to be optimistic. And we have to work hard to not fall victim do not fall prey to those who want to be cynical for the sake of being cynical. Let's be fair. Let's give credit to the economic indicators that have improved. But let's work together to address the challenges that remain. Thank you once again. We'll take a short break for just uh, taking the food. So gentlemen, please help yourself with the buffets, uh, except for table one, two, three, where food will be served, just to sh shorten the serve. So thank you very much. Please. Bismillah. Uh, I'd like to, on behalf of the Pathfinder Group and the Martin Dow Group, again, welcome you to this lunch. And thank you again for coming. We're obviously delighted to have everybody, in particular, obviously, our guest of honor, Mr. Brende, uh, who has a long list of illustrious achievements, which, of course, if I was to go through all of them, I think we'll be here for a long time, and I think dinner would have to be served. So I'll just do a brief introduction uh, for Mr. Brende, if he may. He's had a fantastic political career, 
uh, in Norway, and also obviously a career at the international level. Uh, currently, he serves as president of the World Economic Forum, which of course I am delighted to welcome as a former YGL, although I, I've been told that as a YGL you always remain a YGL, so I'll say current YGL as well. So I'm delighted to welcome him on that behalf. Uh, Mr. Brende has served, uh, among other things, as the Minister of for Foreign Affairs in Norway. He served as the Minister of Trade and Industry. He served as the Minister of Environment. He has also been part of the UN, uh, most notably as part of Sustainable Development. He has been honored many times over by, by, by different institutions and uh, within Norway, uh, within across Europe. Um, and, and in particular, what we look at Mr. Brende for in his capacity as President of the World Economic Forum is his thought leadership. And obviously, I'll let him speak himself about what troubles him or what concerns him. But two areas that I think he's spoken extensively about and written as well are technological disruption and a general global skepticism about the global order that we currently see in the political environment. Two different things, but interlinked. Technological disruption, as you know, we are in the middle of, I think, a term coined by the forum, which is the fourth industrial age. And the disruption is real. Uh, it is estimated that almost 15 to 20 percent of the current jobs that are done by human beings will be automated. And you can just see the impact that will have on the world economy, on people's lives, that these jobs that people do today will become obsolete because robots or some form of automation will take care of those jobs. Secondly, the skepticism about the world order, order is real. It's not isolated to one country here, another country there. It's found expressions, obviously, in the US presidential election, the election in India, Brexit. But, but the winds have blowing across the world. And a world order that I think a lot of us in this room and perhaps the World Economic Forum as well had become comfortable with, a multilateral world which was linked open borders, trade, immigration, is currently under a lot of stress. Currently, it is being questioned by people whose lives have been disrupted, who have lost out thanks to the financial crisis, thanks to the global order. There is a strong view that the rich have become richer, that the poor have become marginalized, and their ranks have grown. And it has found expressions in these populist movements far-right movements, and the far-right movements have benefited in some ways from the technology. So the same technology that perhaps utopians like me thought would bring the world closer together, in some ways is tearing the world apart because they have used social media, they've used other tools that we thought would bring, make a more cohesive world into a world that has become more fractured, a world that is against odds, and the specter of nationalism has come back in our lives that we thought had started to recede. With that, obviously, I, with that introduction, I welcome Mr. Brende. I, uh, we are delighted to have him. Uh, thank you very much for coming to Pakistan, for spending this time with us, and hopefully um, you, know, you get to share your thoughts with us. Thank you again. Thank you. Excellencies, uh, dear friends, ladies and gentlemen, thank you uh, for that uh, very uh, kind uh, introduction. Um, it reminded me uh, about a couple of weeks ago, I was at a dinner where uh, Dr. Kissinger was um, the guest speaker. And after uh, the introduction, uh, before he spoke, he said that, you know, these days I only do speeches because of the introduction. So, um, thank you again for that uh, very kind um, introduction. Uh, also, thank you to uh, Ikram uh, Segal and also the Pathfinder group, um, and also for the Martin Doe group uh, for um, inviting uh, to this excellent uh, luncheon. There is, as you know, no such thing as a free lunch. Uh, so you have to then also bear over with some um, thoughts uh, from my 
uh, side um, today. Um, and um, as also the governor uh, underlined in his uh, speech, uh, the governor of the central bank, uh, he said it's uh, good timing uh, to come to Pakistan because uh, things are moving in the right direction. And I always listen very carefully when a governor is cautiously optimistic. That's a rare thing uh, these days, but I do agree uh, with the governor that there are uh, positive things now uh, happening uh, in uh, the Pakistani uh, economy and also um, related uh, to the political uh, situation in the country that I will uh, come back to. This is a different kind of sight, guys. Uh, the last time I was in Pakistan, uh, I was there when I was uh, foreign minister of Norway, and um, it was uh, not a situation where the economy was doing so well. So I remember I asked one of the people that I met with, I said, oh, how is really the Pakistani economy doing? I asked back then, this is like, uh, four or five years ago, and uh, the person said to me, in confidence, Mr. Minister, worse than last year, but better than next year. And this is not the case uh, at the current moment. I think uh, there is growth, but of course, as also the governor underlined, uh, there is a scope for increasing competitiveness and productivity. I will come back to that, but what are the major changes since last time I was here as a foreign minister. Uh, back then, there were power blackouts. Uh, there was a lack of predictable electricity. I'm not saying that this is not the case today. I think there are still challenges. But Pakistan has a huge potential when it comes to renewables. We know that there are no investments in solar. It's investments also in wind energy. And the hydro potential of this country uh, is almost unparalleled. So uh, no energy, no development, and especially uh, for the manufacturing industry and businesses, for those that have to produce and have a contract, you have to deliver on time. Uh, to get those investments, you also have to have access to uh, competitive uh, electricity that is predictable. I think. Um, the reforms here have no uh, shown yields, and you've seen uh, also yield. And just imagine how fast things change also uh, in the energy field. Ten years ago, uh, the price of solar was so high, high that it was not competitive, for example, compared to coal. Today, ten years later, the price of solar has fallen to one-tenth of it was 10 years ago. This is really, this is not an evolution, this is really a revolution. It has made solar today more competitive as an energy source than coal even in the United States of America. So that might be something that your Prime Minister can mention um, in a couple of weeks when he's, um, he's traveling. Joke aside, um, this uh, reforms on the um, energy side is positive. I also think there has been uh, major uh, changes um, on the security uh, situation. A prerequisite for long-term investing is also that the security situation uh, seriously uh, was addressed, and um, I think this situation now uh, is much better. I think also the talks in Doha uh, between the Afghan government and also t Taliban and Americans are crucial. I think also Prime Minister Imran Khan's visit with uh, President Trump uh, in D.C. in a couple of weeks uh, will also or partly be about uh, the increased um, and um, enhanced uh, security uh, situation uh, in the region. And just imagine if Afghanistan, that has practically been at war, civil war, since 1979, if that can um, calm down, it also opens up uh, for huge 
um, investments and also business opportunities uh, for the whole um, uh, region. So I think these are two very positive uh, elements um, on the energy side and on the security uh, side. And I think on the security side, I also uh, think that uh, the recent visit of Afghanistan's uh, President Afshan uh, Ghani uh, to Pakistan uh, was a very positive element. At the same time, uh, the way uh, the World Economic Forum looks at it is that uh, the economy uh, in Pakistan is at a very uh, critical uh, juncture, uh, positive uh, with uh, no the agreement uh, with IMF that also address some of the short term slash medium term uh, challenges, but they don't necessarily address the structural changes that the governor also touched on. This is, among other things, related to uh, the tax base. Uh, the tax base uh, is uh, incredibly important with a young population uh, that needs education, uh, with infrastructure projects. There also has to be uh, governmental money invested uh, in skills and the future. And if the government are going to invest, the government also needs tax income, revenues. And uh, the overhaul of the tax base, I think, is something that is um, very, very important. I think the red tape situation is something that has to be addressed too. And of course, the productivity uh, issue producing higher up uh, in uh, the value chain. Uh, this is related uh, to competitiveness. So I, I think uh, there is a lot of positive things going on here, but the World Economic Forum would also like uh, to be uh, a real partner uh, with Pakistan uh, on um, this road to increasing its competitiveness. And that's why we're also launching uh, this uh, afternoon uh, with uh, Prime Minister Imran uh, Khan uh, this uh, accelerator when it comes to skills. 60% uh, of your population is under 30 years old. 80% of this population um, also have low education, so the human capital development is crucial for future success. So what we do in this accelerator of skills at this project that we're launching here in Pakistan with the private sector, but also uh, with uh, the government, uh, but also uh, with civil society, is to strengthen the human capital and skills, upskilling, reskilling, and you have to have the right skills uh, to also um, be um, employable uh, in many sectors. We have this accelerator already launched uh, in UAE. We have uh, South Africa, and we have it in Oman, we have it in India. So um, no, uh, it is Pakistan. I'm very happy that we can do this also with the private sector. And the World Economic Forum, as many of you know, but um, I would also like to use this opportunity to underline this, is uh, the International Organization for Public-Private Cooperation. So our aim is to work with governments, civil society, and the private sector to see results. And many of the challenges that we are faced with, also mentioned here um, on the health sector, for example, cannot be dealt with without also mobilizing the private sector. Private sector is 75% of the global GDP. So if you want to solve something, for example, in education, health, you also have to work with the private sector and make the private sector um, agent for uh, change. And uh, was mentioned uh, in Davos at our annual meeting, we have had the launch of Gavi, the vaccination program, where we also seen that without the private sector, a lot of these vaccinations all over the world to save the life of millions of children would not have happened without also the private um, contribution. And sometimes also the private sector has a different way of solving challenges. There is different business models. And after spending almost 30 years of my life in the governmental sector, I have to say that governmental sector can teach business something, but 
be sure, business can also teach uh, the public sector a lot when it comes to effective business models to get things implemented. So um, I'm happy to be uh, back in Pakistan at a time uh, where there is more optimism, but I feel it is also an optimism that is based uh, on uh, realities, but is a cautious optimism. What is achieved uh, is to change a bit of the zeitgeist, but uh, you know, um, and, and also there are some substantial changes, but no is really the time uh, to deliver um, on um, all uh, the opportunities. So, um, when you look at the world uh, in a broader context um, that we deal with on a daily uh, basis, it is also a world that is changing rapidly. It's not only that the geopolitics of the world is changing, because that is definitely happening. We'll be talking about the multipolar world for many years, but no, it is really here. It's unfortunately a little bit like climate change. We've been talking about climate change for decades, but um, I think we're now seeing, unfortunately, that is really happening out there on the ground. So I'm also very happy that the Prime Minister of Pakistan has taken climate change uh, leadership, um, starting with uh, planting, um, I think it was a billion trees, was it? A billion trees in KP. Uh, it's incredible. And also, uh, the plan now on the renewable side uh, is, 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 is crucial. So, uh, Pakistan taking leadership there. On the multipolar world, coming back to my point, uh, we're really seeing that um, it is not anymore one country or two countries um, taking the full leadership. In the multipolar world, it means that there's a lot of nations that see that there are vacuums around and they're trying to fill the vacuums and a lot of nations getting more assertive in this uh, situation. This leads to a more unruly and unpredictable geopolitical reality. But uh, that also opens up uh, some uh, opportunities. Um, as long as uh, we are also aware of the challenges it do create. We also have a multi-conceptual world. We're facing a multi-conceptual world, multipolar, multi-conceptual world. What do I mean with multi-conceptual? Um, there used to be full consensus, or at least countries would say that they were uh, struggling uh, to meet um, um, the consensus about a win-win world, uh, a world uh, where openness and the free trade through the Bretton Woods uh, were uh, the main uh, objectives. And also where we saw that um, countries were aiming um, for democracy, freedom of speech, uh, freedom of the press and all this. No, there are different uh, concepts out there. So um, this is also adding uh, to the complexities. I'm not going to go deeper into this uh, issue, but we will have Q&As and, and questions um, later on. But at the same time, we're also seeing that for the first time in history, emerging economies this year will be more than 50% of the global GDP. 50%. So the emerging economies are more and more important, also Pakistan. It's the first time, at least in 150 years, where Asia is more than 50% of the global GDP. So this is also an Asian century. And also mentioned before, the urbanization rate is unparalleled, and for the first time in history, we have more than 50% of the global population living in cities. And with all the opportunities that give, but also all the challenges it is causing. So on top of the multipolar, multi-conceptual world, we have the new technologies that are changing the way we are producing and the way we are communicating. The fourth industrial revolution. And uh, the changes are happening at the speed that is faster than ever in history, but I think it's the slowest it will be 
this is a slow pace compared to what it will be in the coming decades. So what do I mean? How can I illustrate this? If I had my iPhone here, it's on the table because I didn't want it to disturb uh, the mics. Uh, the iPhone was launched in 2007 by Steve Jobs. That's 12 years ago, the iPhone. Today, there are 2 billion iPhones in the world. Altogether, there are 5 billion uh, modern um, phones out in the market. It has changed totally the way we communicate with each other. It has also made it possible for a lot of um, uh, people in emerging economies and developing uh, economies to be connected. It's potentially changing the, work, the way we do banking and financing uh, with the whole blockchain and open up huge opportunities. But and um, if you look at the apps that were launched in, in 2007, you know Steve Jobs said that you could put apps on the mobile. Today there are hundreds of millions of people working in an industry that did not exist in 2007, the apps economy. And um, this is also opening up a lot of opportunities because you know Pakistan was maybe not a winner in the first, second, and third industrial revolution, but there is no reasons why this country with a young population, if you get it right when it comes to education, get it right when it comes to red tape, get it right when it comes um, also um, uh, to um, uh, those other areas that I, I, I mentioned, I think uh, Pakistan can emerge from the fourth industrial revolution as um, as a country that does well. And things are changing so fast. If you look at the 10 companies in the world today with the highest market cap, the most valuable companies in the world today, most of them did not exist 20 years ago. So, I don't think this will be any different in the decades to come. We don't believe so. Quite the contrary. That means that many of the most valuable companies in the world in 20 years are not even started yet. And there is no reason why they cannot start um, in Pakistan or in an emerging economy. We see that China has no many of the most valuable companies in the world um, there. That wasn't the case. Uh, 20 years ago. Look at China. In 1980, they were 2% of the global economy. Today, they are 19% of the global economy. And this is my message uh, to you to also make sure that we have time for a dialogue. There are no limitations for a country like Pakistan with 200 million people um, with access to energy, strategically positioned, uh, also a very young population that is eager uh, to participate. It is really up to you and the country itself uh, to make sure uh, that uh, it does well. And I think um, you're moving uh, in the right direction. And the message from the World Economic Forum, being the international organization for public-private cooperation, and with some of the more influential companies in the world as our partners, we are also um, we also want to be a part uh, of that story and partner with Pakistan. Thank you. We have time for a few questions. Um, I would request uh, those asking the questions uh, to please uh, keep it very short, a question. Please don't make a statement. And uh, please identify yourself. And uh, I'm sure Mr. Brandy would love to speak that. Yes, please. Mr. Brandy would like to come here. Jee, assalamu alaikum. Uh, my name is Asad Amit Khan, and I am with uh, ACC Pakistan. Uh, my question uh, addressed to Mr. 
Brende, as well as uh, the Honorable State Bank Governor. Uh, we talked about one key stakeholder being the exporter. We talked about human capital. Uh, we have talked about uh, the knowledge economy and uh, upskilling uh, in Pakistan. So how does <coughs> Pakistan fit in as an exporter of services in the years to come? And how can that be facilitated and accelerated? Because I believe that the infrastructure required for export of services is not as extensive as that for other uh, sectors like manufacturing. Thank you. Would you like to come here? Uh, let's have one or two more questions and then he can answer them. Yes, please. Welcome to a very chaotic Pakistan, which Governor Parker has just given us the good news. One year time, the economy will turn around, and I am guessing that six months plus minus, we should hear that the economy is turning around. So can we have the question, sir, because we but have to shut up. Brief, very brief. I'm Air Marshal. One Masu, question, sir. Uh, retired Air Marshal from Pakistan Air Force. How much of a threat do you consider the populist wave in Europe to economy and to national security? What would be your suggestion, if not advice, to us? I know you'll be very polite with the Prime Minister to prevent such a damage to the Pakistan's economy. Thank you. Any other question? Yes, please. First of all, Ayla Majid, uh, uh, Borge, welcome to Pakistan, and I extend this welcome on behalf of all the YGLs. Um, my question rather ask uh, uh, from the World Economic Forum is to uh, uh, create more engagement with Pakistan, and put particularly on three very key areas. One is energy, and one is climate change, and also with regards to skill development that you are already doing. So if we can sort of continue to sort of have more engagements in, in these, we require more thought leadership and collaboration where we can present our story as well and learn and um, take our economy forward. Thank you. To the first question on um, services, um, we know that uh, services is uh, the fastest growing uh, area uh, globally. And um, we also know that um, countries in this uh, region, uh, some countries are very uh, competitive when it comes to uh, also exporting uh, services. Other countries um, will have to develop uh, in this uh, area. If you see, for example, China, that is the largest manufacturer of the world, it still uh, is not um, at that size when it comes to services. It is, in fact, um, also an importer uh, of uh, services. I think India, for example, is a country that have built out um, its um, services sector quite a lot when it comes to uh, ITC, um, and I think that uh, Pakistan uh, has also huge opportunities uh, in this sector. There, but it is also related to what I mentioned and what one of the questions also where, um, uh, where on was this uh, skills. With a very young population, 80% uh, have uh, low uh, education, and 60% of the population is under 30 years uh, old. Uh, getting it right when it comes to primary, secondary education is, of course, crucial, but also the capacity on the university side. I think uh, there really needs to be um, more investments uh, and uh, a bigger size of the university uh, sector uh, in uh, Pakistan in the future, but that also takes time. That's why I think I'm not, I'm not objective, but I think this um, uh, launch that we have this afternoon uh, with this uh, skills accelerator, how can we also short term, medium term see results of upskilling uh, to make people more employable or making sure that they in their job can get 
new skills and upskills that can also uh, be a way of transforming the industry. To your question about uh, populism, populism is easy answers to very complex questions. And you're right that uh, Europe has been uh, through a uh, kind of a wave uh, where um, there has been some gains uh, among uh, populist uh, parties, also nationalistic uh, parties. But recently we also have seen that, for example, the elections uh, in Spain, I also uh, think uh, the situation in France, and the whole European elections were also uh, a reaction to some uh, of this. So uh, we saw the Liberal parties, the Greens and others did pretty well in the European uh, elections. And we also have seen though, lately in the polls in Europe that the support of the European Union to stay as a member in the European Union has never been so high among the remaining countries. Uh, this is also a result. I think people have seen how complex it gets um, you know, following uh, the British referendum uh, on um, the uh, Brexit. But we also are faced with a situation where social media is so powerful. A lot of people get their main information through Facebook or Twitter or other social Instagram or other social media. And um, if you look at social media, there, of course, there's a lot of positive aspects of it too. Let's not get uh, like this doom and gloom. But there are information on social media uh, that is not accurate. Look at, for example, uh, the massive outbreak of measles in Europe and in the US. There is information um, on uh, social media, media say, uh, you know, inspiring um, then uh, parents not to vaccinate their children. You know, together with antibiotics, uh, vaccination is the biggest medical breakthrough uh, we have had uh, in the last century. Uh, that's why we are seeing that never has uh, people been living uh, so long, uh, never have we seen this kind of developments that we have seen the, the last uh, decades. This is due to this. So we are faced with a situation where there is no editor editing the social media. So the only way we can deal with it is really to teach our children how to then um, be able to say this is fake news, this is false news, this is not correct news. They have to navigate in a very, very complex world. When I grew up um, back in the 70s, you know, we, we had one paper uh, that my parents subscribed to and when you read this it was an editor editing every piece and it was accurate and if there was something wrong in the paper you can complain. You know, today there is a massive flow like a Niagara fall of uh, information every day that the young people have to navigate in. And uh, this is a challenge, but of course it can also be an opportunity. So uh, on creating more engagement uh, with the World Economic Forum, um, I think we're now walking the talk on the skills. Uh, I also met uh, with um, the special advisor of the Prime Minister this morning on uh, energy and also met with the minister and special advisor on climate change and uh, um, environment. Uh, I think both in those areas, environment and energy, uh, we have a lot of uh, opportunities. I also met with the special advisor of the prime minister on um, manufacturing skills and commerce and the work we're doing at the World Economic Forum in the future of manufacturing but also the future of um, um, the four, uh, the artificial intelligence and machine learning. These are areas that will change also and have huge impact on Pakistan. And we would like to see Pakistan taking more active part uh, in that work at the World Economic Forum. Because of the shortest time, we'll take uh, three more questions. Yes, please. Hello, 
I am Ambassador Nakhvi and thank you, Mr. Sagal, for inviting me. I will break the uh, pattern, if you, if you allow, and ask uh, Mr. Brende a question, which has always been in my mind. Why does the World Economic Forum hold its meeting in the coldest of weather in mountainous Switzerland and not to it at a more a congenial time? Thank you, sir. Thank you. Next question. Uh, hi, my name is Rizwan Mir. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of Universal Service Fund. And the goal of the fund is to connect the unconnected in Pakistan. So I would love to hear from you uh, some evidence for emerging economies where digital inclusion, connection to the internet has changed the pace of growth and prosperity. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, Moeed. Um, Ikram, sir, thank you for, um, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to be here. And uh, my, one of my questions, Mr. Brende, is the same, because when we were in January in, in Davos, you know, we were, we were wearing several layers and it was difficult to walk. So I think Ambassador Nakhvi has a very good point. Uh, and my second question to you, sir, is that you have announced that World Economic Forum is going to have um, a, skill, to the a skill development um, program with the government of Punjab. Can you give us the timeline? How can we get more information about it? I'm also a publisher, apart from being a television commentator. And we'll be very interested to write uh, about that project. Thank you, sir. Yes. Please. Two easy questions and the one and a half tricky, huh? This is like uh, question time in the parliament. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm not as used to it as, as I, I was, but uh, I think the difference here is that um, at least um, you're receptive uh, to my answers, you know, in parliament. Let's face it, the opposition would like the minister to fail or, or make a gaffe or put his or her foot in the mouth, huh? Uh, but anyway, um, it's, it's, a, it's a great opportunity and um, related to our annual meeting uh, of the World Economic Forum in, uh, in Davos, um, I can recognize that uh, uh, it can be uh, a bit uh, chilly, especially if you come uh, from the southern part of, uh, of uh, Pakistan. Um, I, I think if you're from the Sindh province or something, uh, there is a huge uh, difference. Um, you know, that, that was, was where um, the World Economic Forum um, was started in 1972. So next year, um, we will uh, have our 50th anniversary um, in uh, Davos. But we also have um, a lot of other activities, as uh, I know, you are aware of, we even have for you, sir, a summer Davos. So hereby you are cordially invited. The summer Davos uh, is in China. Uh, we just had it in Dalian uh, in China. Very comfortable, 22, 23 degrees Celsius on the coast overseeing uh, the Korean um, peninsula. Uh, we also have other regional meetings. You have all other work streams. We also now set up a center for the fourth industrial revolution in San Francisco. So you're also cordially uh, invited uh, there. I think there um, you have probably have the most perfect uh, weather uh, in the world. It's uh, basically around 22 degrees um, all year round. Uh, also, uh, of course, uh, we need a lot of heating in, uh, in Davos, but you know, sadly enough, we also need a lot of cooling in the world these days. And I was talking about uh, the major shifts, 50% Asia, 50% emerging economies, 50% uh, also now living in uh, cities. Uh, this is also, uh, unfortunately, quite, um, uh, quite a big change. Know that we use more for the first time in hum human history, we use more electricity on cooling inside houses than we use on heating houses. And this is not stopping. Um, I think in a couple of decades you will see 75% cooling and 25% um, warming up um, houses. This is a digression. 
um, on uh, emerging um, economies and access uh, to internet and also um, digital inclusion. This is crucial. It is crucial because, as I said, I think the fourth industrial revolution can be an opportunity also for emerging economies to really leapfrog. Uh, leapfrog. Those changes, those um, when you are at crossroads, cards are also given out uh, again. Uh, it's really, um, and as I said, uh, there is not a priori given that these and these countries will do well or these and these uh, companies will uh, do well. There is a lot of opportunities there. But some prerequisites for success are there. I think uh, transparency, I think rule of law, I think uh, also access to capital, I think um, not too much uh, unnecessary red tape, uh, a tax base that gives a country the opportunity to invest uh, in their children and in healthcare and in infrastructure, uh, sound fiscal monetary uh, policy. These are prerequisites for doing well. And there, uh, um, also, the digital inclusion and access to internet is no a prerequisite. If you know you have no opportunity in the fourth industrial revolution if you don't have access to this, and those tools are so powerful. It is really you no know, the situation that young kids in Mali, and I've seen it myself, watch teaching from the best teachers in the world um, because they have access to Wi-Fi, and where they don't have teachers that are good in, for example, teaching algebra or something, you can then put it on the screen and you can have the best teachers doing this. But that is, of course, then provided that there is access to internet and their access to those tools. But those tools are much cheaper to know. There are cheaper versions that can be uh, used also uh, in developing uh, countries. And that's why also the World Economic Forum uh, some years ago uh, launched this initiative, Internet for All, where we work with governments, but also with a uh, private sector to make sure that for every child that is growing up, there should be an aim that th that child has access also uh, to uh, the internet and digital inclusion is part of that. We're not there yet, but you know, to also be successful in meeting the sustainable development goals by 2030, eradicating all extreme poverty in the world as the overarching one, we need to secure uh, digital inclusion. I wish you could take more questions, but unfortunately, uh, the Ms. Brenda has another appointment. Um, I would like to thank a lot of people here, first of all, for coming here, starting with Mr. Brenda. And uh, I'm grateful uh, that at short notice, quite short notice, all of you turned up. I'm grateful. I must start personally by thanking General uh, uh, Alikuli. Uh, you know, General uh, Alikuli and myself go back a long way to really low point in Pakistan's history, 1971 and before that, and next to General Ikuli, my sister, Nilofa. And uh, that, you know, really is the embodiment. Uh, let me tell you, when the low point is there, General Ikuli, uh, one of the finest soldiers that this army has ever known, uh, after the surrender, did not surrender. He flew out, all the helicopters of the Pakistan Army Aviation flew out of East Pakistan and landed in Burma, did not surrender. Um, I would also like to thank uh, other uh, people here. Uh, I'm, I apologize to Shabar Zadi Saab. He came a little late, but he was supposed to speak. I'm very grateful to the others. And uh, to people like uh, Mr. Aurangzeb, who left a job, I believe, probably and taken a salary, probably a tenth of his salary, to come here and serve Pakistan. And that is something that one should be proud of, people like him to come back. And to say that, yes, everybody recognizes this. Perception. Perception is nine-tenths of the law. The symbolic visit of Mr. Brandon today, at that time when things are taking place in Pakistan, to do things right. Now, whether it takes place six months, year, you know, but it will take time. And we are going to go through a very rough transition period. But through this rough transition period, you will have people like uh, Mr. Jagra here, the provincial minister for KPK, what a magnificent job he has done for the province. 
right? Young left a great job to come and serve this country, right? Thank you, for Mr. Jagra, for being here. And thank all of you people, all of you who have, who have come here, and uh, people like, you know, I would like to mention Ambassador Zamir Akram, a seven, eight years, supported us for the World Economic Forum, and of course his wife along with him. And uh, they did a magnificent job, you know, because we were in the private sector. And I think I would mention, of course, may not be very political to say so, when uh, somebody in the audience last said, and of course the Prime Minister quoted Anne Rand the other day, and we I grown up on Anne Rand, Atlas Shrugged and Fountainhead, and he quoted Anne Rand, but I remember the Prime Minister Shah uh, Khan Abbasi was asked at Davos, he says, why doesn't the public sector help uh, Mr. Sagal and uh, Mr. Akhai in this uh, great endeavor they're doing? He says, whatever is happening now will also finish. So I think that was a great thing. I think the pub what Mr. Brand is saying, it is the private sector that has to come forth and really be the accelerator to the economy, has been to have the one which has to revive the economy. And of course, it has to do both with a vibrant public sector. I thank you, Mr. Bande. I'm very grateful to you for being here. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you.